Okay, I think we'll get started. So, we're very happy today to have Tracy Slotier with us today from MIT. Uh, Tracy is a theoretical high energy physics professor. Tracy grew up in Australia and also in the South Pacific Islands. She completed her PhD at Harvard in 2010 under Doug Finkbeiner. She then went to a postdoc at the IAS before moving to a faculty position at MIT in 2013, and she's been there since. Tracy is well known for her discovery of the Fermi bubbles, which is the massive structure exploding from the center of our galaxy. And for this, she was awarded a Rossi Prize in 2014. Tracy is, in my opinion, uh, perhaps the leading, the leading researcher in astroparticle and cosmological searches for dark matter. So we're really lucky to have her with us today to tell her about her research. She has been awarded a number of prizes, including the Henry Primakoff Award from the APS for Early Career Scientists, the Presidential Early Career Award, and the New Horizons Prize in uh, Physics for, and this is the citation, major contributions to particle astrophysics from models of dark matter to the discovery of the Fermi bubbles. So thanks a lot, Tracy, for visiting, and we're looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much for that really kind introduction, Ben. Now I have a lot to live up to. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy to be back here. I have very much enjoyed previous visits to Berkeley. We were trying to figure out today how long it's been since I was here in person. I think it was pre-pandemic. So um, thank you all very much for welcoming me back. So I would like you to tell you today about some work that my group has been doing over the last year or so to think about how, dark, how the new physics of dark matter could potentially show up in the cosmic background radiation up to and including affecting the birth of the first stars. So this will be based on these papers here with my awesome team of collaborators. I'm Josh Foster, Hong Wen Liu, Julian Munoz, Wen Zichin, Greg Ridgway, and Yutian Sun. So I was just told that you had my colleague Lindley Winslow from MIT here last week who told you about other ways to search for dark matter. So I want to begin by talking a little bit about the dark matter problem, why we think, you know, and why we would like to look for non-gravitational interactions of dark matter. This may be somewhat repetitive with Lindley's colloquium. If you're already persuaded of this, you can, you know, take a little break, relax a bit as I go through this. But But then I do want to give you an argument for, ah, uh, yeah, sorry. Better? OK, very good. But then I do want to give you an argument for uh, why we should look for these non-gravitational interactions of dark matter, both generally and specifically in cosmological data. Then I want to tell you a bit about some handy cosmological observables that could potentially give us, into insights, give us insights into whether dark matter has been secretly transferring energy into visible particles over the history of our universe. And then we'll talk through what the signals of dark matter might look like in these observables if they were there. Starting with some back of the envelope estimates so that you have a sense of how the physics work. So moving on to some existing limits that we've already set on dark matter annihilation and decay using these observables. And then in the back half of the colloquium, telling you about the stuff that we've been doing over the last year to map out new possible signals of energy injection into the early universe. All right, so here is my general dark matter propaganda slide. I spend a lot of my time thinking about what dark matter might be. This is one of the great puzzles of fundamental physics. And the basic problem is that we have multiple lines of evidence that more than 80% of the matter in the universe is dark, by which we just mean that if it interacts with light, it does so very weakly. If it interacts with the known particles, it does so pretty weakly. The word transparent matter might actually be a slightly better name, since you, this stuff isn't black, it doesn't absorb light, but we coined dark and so we're stuck with it. So all we mean by matter is that it gravitates, it behaves like matter from the perspective of its gravitational pull on other objects, and that gravitational pull is how we know almost everything we know about dark matter. We see it, we see the evidence for dark matter in the rotation curves in galaxies, tell us that stars and gas clouds orbiting around galaxies need dark matter present to support those orbits. We observe, in the gravitational lensing of colliding galaxy clusters, we observe that there appears to be a mass component that is not correlated with the luminous matter. 
We see imprints of dark matter in the cosmic microwave background radiation, which I'll talk more about in a few slides, which is sometimes called the afterglow radiation of the Big Bang. And even the fact that the galaxies we see out there in the universe formed and have the properties and structure that they do likely reveals the presence of an underlying scaffolding of dark matter. But everything I just told you only comes from inferring the presence of dark matter through its gravitational pull on visible particles. That's how we've learned every positive statement that we currently can make about dark matter. That's it. That distribution does not look like the distribution of ordinary matter. And it is sufficient to tell us, and I'm happy to go into more detail on this if people want, that there are no really good candidates for explaining this dark matter within the physics that we currently understand. That makes it one of our biggest clues to what might lie beyond known physics. So, uh, when faced with a problem like this, of course, particle theorists get to work and uh, produce figures that look something like this. So this is a cartoon from, that a colleague of mine made about uh, a little over 10 years ago now for the snow mass community planning process that was happening at that time. And so the idea of the, I do not want you to read and understand everything on this cartoon. I'll just give you the basics. The idea of this cartoon is that everything within the red lines is a class of ideas for what dark matter might possibly be, and everything outside the red lines is a bigger problem to which the dark matter puzzle might connect. So for example, dark matter could be related to new symmetries of our universe, like supersymmetry. It could be related to extra dimensions of our universe. It could tell us about puzzles in the Higgs sector, or the strongly interacting particles, or the neutrino sector. Dark matter could even be the tip of an iceberg of a new sector of new particles and new forces that we don't know about because the particles, forces that we don't know about because the particles that we do know don't feel them in the same way that dark matter doesn't seem to feel electromagnetism. So there are lots of really exciting ideas for what dark matter could be, and if we could figure, out, figure it out, it could be a key to unlock a broader set of questions about new physics. But the bad news <laughs> is that, so yeah, so that's one point I'd like you to take away from that slide. A second point is that there's no shortage of ideas for what dark matter could be. We have lots of viable possibilities to explain this mystery dark component of our universe, but the bad news is that all of these scenarios are broadly consistent with the data as they currently stand. We don't have a great way with existing data to distinguish them from each other. And part of that is because many of these theories, well, they all predict matter that is dark. They have pretty much the same gravitational footprints and the pretty, pretty much the same expected distribution through the universe. So uh, that's, that's tricky. There is an enormous variety of plausible dark matter scenarios but many of these scenarios are basically equivalent from the perspective of their gravitational pull on ordinary matter. They lead to basically the same distribution of dark matter through the universe. There are some exceptions to this, and we absolutely should keep trying to map out how dark matter is distributed through the universe to get at those properties. If the dark matter is really light, 10 to the minus 19 EV, then that will modify its distribution on scales that we could probe. If it's very heavy, like individual dark matter particles or tiny black holes left over from the universe's first moments, that could lead to gravitational lensing effects or evaporation effects that we could probe. If dark matter is sufficiently fast moving, that will change its distribution, we could look for that. If it has its own strong self-interactions, if those new forces I mentioned cause dark matter particles to you know, continuously bounce off each other and transfer energy and momentum, that can change its distribution as well. So these are all properties that we can try to get after we can try to get up by looking at how dark matter is distributed through the universe. But unfortunately, for many of the classes of models on the previous page, uh, none of these effects would really be distinguishable from just an inert, not too heavy, not too light particle that has only weak self-interactions and is pretty cold. So if we would like to distinguish them, rule them out, maybe identify one, as the true answer for the bulk of the dark matter in our universe, it would be great if we could get a handle on non-gravitational interactions of dark matter. I guess Lindley Winslow probably came last week and told you about awesome new experimental technologies to go look for non-gravitational interactions between axions and photons. And that is one facet of a very large ongoing experimental and theoretical program to search for such interactions across a range of different modalities, across looking in accelerators, in direct detection searches, in precision experiments, and in astrophysical observations. And many of the faculty and postdocs and grad students, maybe undergrads sitting here in this room, have been involved in such projects. So this is a big multifaceted program. But what I want to talk to you about today is one particular aspect of this program, 
which is that if there are non-gravitational interactions between the dark matter and the visible matter, then one pretty generic consequence of those interactions could be a transfer of energy between the dark matter and the visible matter of the universe over the history of the universe. So what I want to lay out here is ask the question of, you know, what would that look like? What are some ways that that could show up? How would we see it if something like that was going on? So let me be a little bit more specific about what I mean by uh, interactions here. Let me give you some examples. So a very classic benchmark for this kind of thing is the idea that maybe dark matter can annihilate. Maybe it's possible that out there in space, when two dark matter particles collide with each other, it's like a matter-antimatter collision. Some a miracle occurs. This is the new physics that we would like to probe. And visible particles are produced. Those particles could be any of the particles in the standard model. SM here stands for standard model of particle physics. DM stands for dark matter. And most standard model particles are unstable. They decay quickly. And the, so we understand those decays. We've measured them. Uh, we can predict them. And that would uh, produce a bunch of long-lived known particles. So photons, electrons, positrons, neutrinos, antineutrinos, maybe some protons and antiprotons, and even heavier nuclei and antinuclei. Now, I, I often also show this slide when I'm talking about just astrophysical searches for dark matter. Look out at the sky. See if you can see this spectrum. But if this happened in the early universe, it would mean that over time you can take a little bit of the energy that is stored in the mass of the dark matter, E equals mc squared, and convert that into visible particles scattering through the universe, modifying the cosmic history. Now, for dark matter annihilation, there's kind of a natural benchmark, right? Because in many scenarios for what dark matter could be, this process is tightly linked to the abundance of dark matter in the present day, because it's this process that depletes dark matter in the early universe. So if this process is very efficient, you end up with not very much dark matter. If this process is slow, you end up with a lot of dark matter. We know how much dark matter there is in the universe. So if that's what's going on, we can infer kind of a benchmark annihilation rate. So I may show on some later slides, there may be a line that says thermal relic annihilation rate. Uh, if so, then this is the number that it means. And that just means if you had that annihilation rate, you pretty naturally get the right amount of dark matter in the universe. But there are other ways to get the right amount of dark matter. And so another process that people often think about for energy transfer is just dark matter decay. We believe that dark matter must be pretty stable because it, um, it, it, still, it still appears to be around today. We, still, we see that galaxies haven't flown apart, that galaxy clusters appear to have a mass component that doesn't trace their gas. So the dark matter should have a lifetime that is longer than the age of the universe. But as I'll argue to you, it could have a lifetime much longer than the age of the universe, and it could still be true that particles produced through dark matter decay could have a big impact on the universe's history. So here, basically the same process as annihilation, except you don't need two dark matter particles in the initial state. You can just have one that decays over time, again, produces standard model particles that eventually decay and make photons, electrons, positrons, neutrinos, antineutrinos, and so on. Now, this is not an exhaustive set of mechanisms for energy transfer. Uh, dark matter could just bounce off standard model particles, transfer energy like you, you learned about in your mechanics class, transferring energy and momentum. Uh, that's fine, and that's actually, I could give you a whole separate talk on probes of that kind of scattering, but the thing to remember in that case is that there you don't have access to the dark matter's mass energy. You only have access to its kinetic energy. So you just have a much smaller um, energy budget. There are models of light dark matter people here have worked on where the dark matter could potentially get absorbed onto standard model particles. If you were at Lindley's, colloquium last week. You could have heard about light dark matter oscillating into photons and vice versa under the right circumstances. So these can all be um, possible energy transfer mechanisms. And the tools that I show you can be used for general energy transfer and energy injection mechanisms. That's it. For the purpose of this talk, when I show you plots, they're mostly going to be about either dark matter annihilation or dark matter decay. But think of these as examples of energy transfer between the sectors, not as an exhaustive list. OK. So now we're imagining a situation where we're in one of the ensemble of models for dark matter, where dark matter annihilation, dark matter decay, or a similar process can occur that drains energy out of the mass in the dark matter and turns it into visible standard model particles that have nothing to do with the temperature of the universe that are now just bouncing around this early universe. What would they do? So to answer that question, I want to talk a little bit about various cosmological observables. OK, so this is the nice cartoon of cosmic history that I got off the internet. So at the beginning, we had the Big Bang. And then there was all this interesting and exciting physics that particle physicists care about in the first couple of 100,000 years of the universe's history. But for the purposes of the searches that I'm going to talk about, 
our timeline mostly begins with the emission of the cosmic microwave background radiation when the, when the universe was about a million years old. Now, I'm going to use the term redshift a fair bit in this talk. What redshift means is the expansion factor from that epoch to the universe today. So if the universe, if I'm talking about a time when the universe was a thousand times smaller than it was today, that's redshift a thousand. The temperature of the universe, uh, the universe gets cooler as it expands. The temperature is roughly inverse to this expansion factor. So, we take, so you can also think of this expansion factor as a measurement of the temperature of the universe compared to the temperature today. So let's take this redshift 1,000. So this was a somewhat special number in the universe's history. When the universe was more than 1,000 times smaller than it is today, so a redshift greater than 1,000, we believe that the universe was filled with a highly ionized plasma of, elect with an, of electrons, protons, photons, neutrinos, presumably dark matter, um, maybe you know a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of heavy a little component of heavier nuclei, very occasional uh, antimatter, and it was almost perfectly ionized. Now the photons were tightly coupled to this plasma. They were the, so the photon bath has been there since the Big Bang, but uh, up until this period when the redshift was about a thousand times smaller than it was today, they were continuously bouncing off this, char this charged plasma to which they were tightly coupled. So if we modify the properties of that plasma, that can have flow-on effects on the spectrum of photons that we observe today. So this is going to be one of our potential observables. Now, at this transition point around redshift of a thousand, this is sometimes called the epoch of last scattering or the recombination epoch. What happened here was that the ionization level of the universe dropped rather abruptly for reasons that we understand. Basically, the temperature dropped to the point that the, pla that the ions in the plasma started to form into neutral hydrogen and helium atoms. So at that point, photons love to scatter off charged particles. They're not so great at scattering off neutral particles. At that point, the ionized plasma largely coalesced into neutral hydrogen and helium, and these photons of the cosmic microwave background began to stream free of the electrons and protons. Those photons, for many of those photons, the next time they scattered on anything was when they reached our telescopes. This redshift corresponds to a time scale of about three or 400,000 years. So for the subsequent 14 billion years, most of these photons were just propagating towards our telescopes. This is the oldest light that we measure, gives us the earliest direct observations of our cosmos, and it acts as a backlight for all the subsequent epochs. Now then, down to redshift of around 10, the universe remained in this mostly neutral hydrogen and helium state. And most of this period is often called the cosmic dark ages. So in this case, the density of free electrons was pretty low, neutral hydrogen was abundant, and so you know, we have some atomic physics. As the photons of the cosmic microwave background shine through this epoch, they can excite atomic transitions, or if the gas is hot enough, it can emit radiation that joins the cosmic microwave background radiation. And we do, while the universe is pretty neutral, it's not entirely neutral gas, there are still some free electrons and some ions around, and those can scatter the photons of the cosmic microwave background. So this cosmic microwave background radiation, this photon bath that pervades the universe, is going to tell us something about this primordial plasma to which it was coupled, but that it's going to tell us something about uh, the properties of that plasma as we went through this epoch of last scattering, and it's also going to tell us something about how many scatterers there were available to it, what happened after the epoch of last scattering. Now then down around redshift 10, so it's starting around you know, redshift 20, 30, we believe that the first star, when the universe was about 100 million years old, the first stars start to be born. And we'll come back to that later, about exactly how that happens later in this colloquium. Once those stars turn on, they start producing a lot of radiation that can break the hydrogen and helium atoms back apart again so we say that the stars reionize the universe. This is the epoch of reionization, the epoch when the first stars are born is sometimes called cosmic dawn, first sunrise in the universe. And, uh, and so after that point, the neutral gas becomes pretty rare. So throughout both this cosmic dark ages period and this cosmic dawn period, the background light interacting with the atoms can produce features in the radiation spectrum that tell us something about the properties of the gas. So by looking at this background radiation, we can potentially learn about the properties of the primordial plasma, what was going on during the cosmic dark ages that stood between our telescopes and the emission of the cosmic microwave background, and the properties of the gas at lower redshifts. So let's have a look at what those observables look like. So here is a picture of the cosmic microwave background radiation as we measure it all over the sky. 
This is from the Planck Telescope of the European Space Agency. So this is a snapshot of the C this is a snapshot of the temperature anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background, these hot and cold spots. So these are telling you about our, these are telling you about the photon intensity across the sky. And what they primarily describe is the pattern of oscillations in density and temperature of the primordial plasma. This information is actually, I've said that dark matter is more than 80% of the universe. That information is encoded in this paper. And those of you who don't know about it, uh, you can look it up or you can ask me later. So, but it also has, as we said, encoded in it some information about what happened to this light after it was first emitted, about the post-recombination corrections from scattering and other physics. There's another piece of information in the cosmic microwave background which is often not shown, which is, that it, which is its spectral information. So what is the distribution of these photons with respect to energy? So this is a plot from 1990 from the Kobe Fire S experiment. It's got energy on the x-axis and uh, a measurement of intensity on the y-axis. And the line going through this is a black body spectrum that is fitted to the data. These are data points with 400 sigma error bars. And I dream of being able to run an experiment where my error bars look like that. But uh, so this is a really beautifully measured black body. This spectrum is a black body to a really good approximation. And we haven't measured it since 1990 because we did such a good job then. Subsequent CMB experiments have generally said, yeah, we'll just focus on these anisotropies which for scale are at the level of about 10 to the minus five. Um, for, this dis for this black body spectrum, we know the distortions are less than about 10 to the minus five. If there are distortions there at that level, we don't know what they are. But in principle, those distortions could hold information about behavior of the primordial plasma and in particular energy injections into the primordial plasma at both early and late times. Now I said, so this is sort of the, uh, the continuum background of the cosmic radiation. It also said we could look for features in this spectrum. And a class of features that you do expect to see is atomic transition lines. So these can prove the gas temperature, the ionization level, and the 3D distribution of the gas. So one class of atomic transition lines that's been studied in a lot of detail is called the Lyman Alpha Forest, which tells us how the universe behaved after reionization around redshift two to six. So after reionization, there were still clouds of neutral hydrogen gas around, and in this case, the backlight is not just the CMB, but bright quasars, so bright sources of radiation occurring at high redshift. And I'll show you this little cartoon credited to Andrew Ponson, which is when light shines out from one of these quasars and passes through the universe to us, as it passes through these gas clouds, um, the light gets absorbed by the hydrogen gas, leading to these steep dips, these absorption lines in the spectrum. Then as the universe expands, those absorption lines get shifted to lower and lower energies, meaning that there's room for when it, the light next goes to a gas cloud to pick up more absorption lines at the original characteristic energy. So that gives you this forest of lines that's called the Lyman Alpha Forest. This is a static image of the Lyman Alpha Forest associated with one particular quasar. And these lines give us information about the distribution of gas clouds in this case, but also about like, the temperature of the gas clouds that you're passing through. Now, okay, and we're, so we're gonna come back to that a little bit later because the Lyman Alpha Forest is a great observable, but there's a very active experimental effort in place to try to measure more of these atomic emission and absorption lines and from earlier redshifts, and by that get information about the properties of the universe at earlier times. All right, so let me just say a little bit about you know, what are our experimental prospects for progress in this area. So let's start with those distortions of that black body continuum background. So we'll tell you, we'll say that if we have any energy injection into the universe from dark matter or from some other source at redshifts less than about 10 to the six, so when the universe was more than a, million a millionth of the size it is today, corresponding to temperatures less than about one kilo electron volt, then they'll generically leave imprints in this spectrum. And that's been studied in quite a bit of detail. This is a nice review article from a couple of years ago. Uh, we last measured this black body spectrum in 1990. The, if you talk to the experimentalists who work on these areas, they say that advances in detector technology and cryo cryogenics have opened up the possibility of improving those 1990 limits by several orders of magnitude if we flew an experiment that was capable of doing this observation. So this plot is showing, uh, again, as energy on the x-axis, measure of intensity on the y-axis. This um, blue line is showing our current sensitivity 
to distortions. These different colored lines are showing the expected future sensitivity of our various proposed experiments that could go after this. And these black and gray lines are showing potential signals that you could hope to see in this observable. So this is not a case where there's an experiment right around the corner, but it is a case where uh, if we did a follow-up observation, we could potentially buy several orders of magnitude over where we currently stand. Now the anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background, that's a beautiful probe. This has been the workhorse of cosmology for the last few decades. We have measured these anisotropies so these are, this is the spatial information I told you about. We've measured them via a range of experiments, including WMAP, Planck, Acton, SPT. And here, the major constraint that we get on, or at least a very important constraint that we got on energy injection from these anisotropies is to look at the effect caused by extra ionization after, during those cosmic dark ages. So normally what would happen is the CMB photons just fly, are emitted at this early time. They fly to our telescopes like Planck, uh, but if we have extra free electrons produced by energy injection, then uh, that will deflect and uh, that will deflect some of those CMB photons and modify that pattern of anisotropies on the sky. So if we know how an extra little bit of energy from dark matter or from other source changes the ionization history, we can translate that into a constraint from how it affects the CMB anisotropies. Another class of observables where, again, there's potential for a lot of experimental progress in the next few years is, the, uh, is what's called the, is 20, is primordial 21 centimeter lion searches. So this gives us a handle on a new observable, which is the temperature of the gas at late times. Okay, if we inject energy into the universe from dark matter or some other source, we might expect it to heat up the gas at some level. So one way to do that is to search for atomic transition lines. That Lyman Alpha forest that I told you about before does set com some constraints on how hot the gas was at redshifts two to six. But the 21 centimeter spin flip hyperfine transition of neutral hydrogen would potentially allow us to go back much earlier in redshift. So let's just talk a little about a bit about the physics of this transition. So the idea here is the gas is illuminated by the cosmic microwave background. The gas, a individual hydrogen atom, could either be in the excited state or the ground state of this transition. If it's in the excited state, you'll get emission lines on top of the background cosmic microwave background. If it's in the ground state, you'll get absorption lines on top of the cosmic microwave background. Now, some of the hydrogen's gonna be in the excited state, some is gonna be in the ground state, so in principle, you'll get both of these effects, and the question is which one wins out. So we can characterize this by what's called the spin temperature of the hydrogen, which just tells you how, man, how much of the hydrogen is in the excited state versus the ground state. It's defined as a temperature in that um, TS tells you the temperature at which if these hydrogen atoms were just in equilibrium with the radiation, then you know, at what temperature would you get this correct, would you get the ratio that is observed? You know, if I tell you that like half, that 54% uh, you know, of the hydrogen is in the ground state and 46% is in the excited state, that corresponds to a specific radiation temperature. That's the spin temperature of the gas. So if the spin temperature is higher than the ambient radiation temperature, that means that more particles are in the excited state than you would have expected from the radiation bath, so you get a net emission signal. If the spin temperature is lower than the radiation temperature, that means more particles are in the ground state than you would have expected, and you get a net absorption signal. And this gives you a measure, so you can work out signal, this is the 21 centimeter brightness temperature that tells you how much 21 centimeter line emission you get. It depends on the amount of neutral hydrogen that you have in the universe. Uh, depends somewhat on various other cosmological parameters, which are not gonna be critical for us. And uh, it depends on this factor, one minus the radiation temperature divided by the spin temperature. So this is just what we set up here, that if the spin temperature is um, less than the radiation temperature, you get a uh, then, then you get uh, absorption here and otherwise emission. So we can try to look for this red-shifted lion, try to measure its strength, and that will potentially give us information on the amount of neutral hydrogen around and the temperature of the gas. This is not an a measurement that has been done yet. There are a large number of experiments, well, with one possible exception, there was a claim detection a few years ago, which seems to be you know, in tension with some subsequent observations. But there are a large number of experiments trying to measure this primordial 21 centimeter signal 
because it really would give us a new window on the temperature and ionization properties of the gas at the end of the cosmic dark ages and at the and during cosmic dawn. So this is kind of what the expectation of the signal looks like as a function of redshift. So we're starting the right end of this panel is high redshift early times. Uh, initially, there's very little 21 centimeter emission, but when the, um, when the first stars turn on, they produce photons, they, they, they um, cause an interaction that couples the hydrogen spin temperature closely to its actual kinetic temperature, to the gas temperature. Now, this lower plot here is showing you what we would expect the temperature of the gas to be like compared to the temperature of the photons in the case where there was no heating from stars or from any other physics, such as dark matter annihilation or decay. So this black dashed line is the temperature of the photons. This blue line is the temperature of the gas. And they stay the same up to about redshift 200 because the gas and photons are, are efficiently scattering off each other to that point, and then they diverge. So what we would expect is when this 21 centimeter signal first turns on, the gas is colder than the radiation, so we get an absorption signal, which is indicated in red and yellow on this plot. Then, as the first stars start to turn on, they produce a lot of radiation that heats and ionizes the universe. That brings the gas temperature up. The 21 centimeter signal goes into emission, and then eventually, as the universe reionizes down around redshift 10, we don't have any neutral hydrogen anymore. We can't get any 21 centimeter line signal, and, uh, and the signal dies away. So that's what people are looking for. A clean signal of energy injection could be additional heating up here that heats the gas in the period where we would normally expect it to be colder than the CMB. But more generally, this could um, just give us a lot of information about the temperature and ionization level of the universe at a time where currently we don't have much of a window on it. Uh, about a little over a year ago, the HERA telescope, which is one of those active 21 centimeter searches, put out upper limits on the power spectrum based on uh, about 100 nights of data from 2018. With a, so this is with about 10% of the antennas that they eventually expect to have and focused on the epoch of reionization. So this plot over here is sort of showing what their limits look like. This is a measurement of the gas temperature relative to the radiation temperature. These black lines are showing how you would expect it to evolve in different cosmological models. Uh, these colored points over here are showing where Hera's current limits are. So you know, you're got, getting to the point where they're starting to set limits that exclude some scenarios. And hopefully in the not too distant future, we might get a firm detection in this channel. So Hera phase two is currently uh, in commissioning. It's going to have 350 antennas covering a redshift range from about five to about 30. So uh, this is something to keep an eye out for in the next few years. Uh, these, the, you may notice these little dots over on this side of this plot. This car, I said there was a possible detection a couple of years ago. That red data point is the claim detection from over there. The blue line is a bound from another experiment. They seem to be in some tension. If this was true, um, it would really transform our understanding of cosmology at these times. So most people think that it's probably um, an instrumental error, but uh, worth keeping in mind for follow-ups. All right, so this is what I want to tell you about potential observables. So by looking at, so we, we can look at the cosmic background radiation, we can look at anisotropies in it, we can look at its energy spectrum, and we can look for Lyon features. So now what I want to talk about is first the back of the envelope and then the quantitative version of what would energy injection do to these observables. And first, I just want to think a little bit about the energy budget, if where we're taking these signals from is from dark matter. So we know that about 80% of the matter in the universe is dark matter, which means that for every hydrogen atoms, which is about, which weighs about one GeV, there should be about, um, you know, we, there should be about five GeV of dark matter. The total energy stored in this non-relativistic dark sector would be about 5 GeV per hydrogen atom. So we know how much energy it takes to ionize a hydrogen atom, right? It's about 13.6 EV. So that tells us that if we could use this full 5 GeV of energy, then the total power that we need, for example, to ionize a hydrogen atom is, say, 10 EV per hydrogen atom. 
So that means that ionizing all the hydrogen in the universe would require two times 10 to the minus nine of the energy stored in the dark matter mass. So it's a pretty, so with a pretty small fraction of this energy budget, you can do a lot. If you wanted to heat up all the baryons in the universe by one electron volt, doesn't sound that much, but that corresponds to heating the entire universe by 10,000 degrees Kelvin. That takes about two times 10 to the minus 10 of the dark matter energy budget. There's a lot of energy stored in the dark matter. So ask about what about perturbing that radiation field, that cosmic microwave background radiation that we looked at. So in the present day, there's about uh, 3,000 times as much energy in the matter as there is in the radiation. So that means if we wanted to induce a 10 to the minus 5 distortion in the CMB at its peak, that would take about 10 to the minus 8 of the total energy budget. So like just a general lesson from this, actually. When we say we haven't seen, we, you know, we've excluded variations away from that black body spectrum larger than about 10 to the minus 5, it actually takes a lot of energy to move the black body spectrum. There is quite a lot of energy stored in it. You can see that things like ionizing the whole universe or heating up the whole universe by tens of thousands of degrees Kelvin um, actually, in principle, cost less energy than uh, even a pretty small shift to the cosmic microwave background radiation. That said, if you want to distort the lower high frequency tails of the CMB, that takes less work. But this is one of the reasons why when I told you earlier we could maybe go a few orders of magnitude better in modifying the CMB, there are interesting signals in, in that range. A few orders of magnitude better in sensitivity to modifications to the CMB black body. Okay, so, so that's our budget. So we know that if only, that if we take just a tiny amount, one to a billion, one to a trillion, fraction of the energy stored in the dark matter, we can potentially have major effects on the ionization level, the temperature level of the universe, and thus affect the observables that we've talked about. This applies to processes where we can use all the mass energy of the dark matter. If we only have access to the kinetic energy, then you can dial this down by a factor of V squared of, uh, of the dark matter, which is typically a pretty small number. So we can do that, but typically we need uh, much larger cross-sections. And like just for credit, this, you know, this basic idea of using these observables to prove energy transfer isn't new to me. It goes back, uh, it goes back a long time. But I want to show you some uh, you know, beyond the back of the envelope signals of what, what this could look like, how this could change the universe. I'll also say that you know, what I've just told you about having this huge energy budget, this isn't really specific to early universe cosmology. Like this is just a general statement about there's a lot of energy stored in the dark matter if you have a process that takes energy out of the mass of the dark matter and turns it into visible particles, then you can potentially have a really large signal. This is also relevant to indirect detection, where we look for these particles out in, um, out, out in our galaxy. So they too can constrain very small fractions of the dark matter, annihilating or decaying. Okay, so that's, so you know, that, that's, our, that's our basic setup. Uh, so we've understood that dark matter processes could transfer energy into visible particles. A very small fraction of that energy could potentially be sufficient to have large effects. And we're going to prove this using observables involving the cosmic radiation background and the continuum in its anisotropies and in its, um, and in its lions. So now let's, uh, let me go on and uh, well, okay. do one back of the envelope example. And then, we'll, and then we'll go on and show you what the detailed results look like. So the back of the envelope example, suppose we think about decaying dark matter. The fraction of dark matter decaying in a given, per epoch in a given epoch is roughly like how old the cosmos was at that epoch divided by the overall lifetime of the dark matter. So if I tell you that, okay, I reckon that I can rule out dark matter heating up the whole universe by 50,000 Kelvin when the universe was a billion years old, say, which is about the relevant epoch for the Lyman Alpha forest, then that means that I can constrain uh, so that means that I'm constraining an order one in a billion dark matter particles decayed when the universe was around a billion years old. That means that I'm going to be able to rule out lifetimes that are shorter than 10 to the 8 times the present day lifetime of the universe, around a few times 10 to the 25 seconds. So when I said before dark matter had better be longer lived than the universe's history, um, yes, really quite, quite a lot longer lived, eight orders of magnitude if you don't want to uh, overheat the universe by a large factor. You'd get similar numbers if I said, okay, let me say that I can rule out even a 10 to the minus 12 fraction of dark matter decaying when the universe was much younger, around a million years old, which is relevant for the CMB epoch. 
can also say, well, what if it's not dark matter? What if there was just some other species that decayed away in the early universe, produced a bunch of energetic particles, heated up and ionized the cosmos? So you can probe even really, really tiny um, contributors to the overall matter density of the universe if they have a lifetime in the right range. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about in my remaining time is uh, trying to sort of figure out a map for if processes like this were going on, what would the early universe signatures look like so that we can translate arbitrary energy injection models into observable signal predictions and constraints. And a tool that my group has built and used for this is called Dark History. So this is a tool for computing the modified ionization and temperature histories of the universe in the presence of such an energy injection. So the physics that we need to study here to go beyond this back of the envelope estimate is to understand, so I told you annihilation or decay produce these potentially high energy electrons, positrons, photons, neutrinos, and so on. Um, we need to understand how those particles cool down and transfer their energy into our observables. So heating, ionization, changes to the changes to the cosmic background radiation, changes to the 21 centimeter line emission. So a few years ago, my collaborators, uh, Hong Wen Liu and Greg Ridgway, and I wrote a public code package that models the energy loss processes and production of these secondary particles, so it's like a particle cascade extending through the universe, accounting for the fact that the universe is expanding all the time. And we've done various versions of this. Those of you who think about machine learning, you can make this code more compact and faster using neural networks, and my student Yitian Sun did some work on that. So you don't need to know what's in the guts of dark history for this talk, but this is just an example of what, what calling it looks like. So you basically just tell the code in this case to evolve the universe. This is an example with dark matter annihilation, with the specified mass of the dark matter, with the specified cross section, specified channels of standard model particles that annihilates to. That tells you what kind of photons, electrons, positrons, so on you're going to get out. And you run the code, it computes how these particles cool down and lose their energy in an expanding universe. And it gives you outputs like this. So this is redshift on the x-axis. This is ionization history on the y-axis and temperature. A ionization history in this plot and temperature in this lower plot. And the, the black dashed line is what you would have in the absence of the energy injection. The solid lines show what you would have in the presence of the energy injection. So you can turn that, those changes to the ionization and temperature history then into signals in, as we discussed earlier, the anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background. Ionization affects that and into changes to the Lyman alpha forest, which depends on the temperature and ionization level of the gas. And also into changes to the 21 centimeter signal. So this upper panel is showing the constraints from a few years ago that you get from looking at the annihilation effects from, um, look at the constraints on annihilation from the extra ionization that they cause during the cosmic dark ages. This is a cross section on the y axis. Uh, dark matter mass on the x-axis, these different colored lines correspond to annihilating into different standard model particles, and uh, everything above these colored lines is ruled out. And this black dashed line is that benchmark cross-section that I told you about before. So basically what this says is that if the annihilation was happening with this benchmark cross-section throughout the early universe, then the dark matter should be lighter than about 10 GeV if it's producing almost any standard model particle. This lower panel is showing a set of constraints on decaying dark matter. Uh, this green line is the constraints that you would get from looking at heating in the Lyman alpha forest. This red line is showing what constraints you would get from the cosmic microwave background anisotropies from looking at ionization effects. Again, mass on the x-axis, lifetime on the y-axis. So now shorter lifetimes correspond to more energy injections. So the colored regions are rolled out, the white region is open. These gray regions so, show some searches that you could do with um, indirect detection, so from paper by Fagonetti et al. And this blue region shows a forecast for what you would be able to do if you got a, um, a positive observation of 21 centimeter Lyon emission. And again, these just all come from looking at these energy injections would affect the temperature and ionization history of the universe and would affect these observables as we discussed. So, over the last year, my group present worked out a new version of dark history, which really tracked this cascade of secondary particles carefully as they went down to arbitrarily low energies. And this let us predict how different models of dark matter 
would distort that black body spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. That's the thing we last measured in 1990. So this upper panel is showing an example of one such distortion. So these, um, these purple, so the, here what's going on is the um, black line is showing the expected distortion from a particular dark matter model, and the other colored lines are showing uh, different sources of spectral distortion that would appear within the standard model. And this little black dotted line is showing the estimated sensitivity of a next generation spectral distortion experiment. What I want you to take away from this is not so much the features of this particular model, but that we now have a full pipeline for you tell me any model of how we threw high energy particles into the early universe, you can get out the shape of, the, uh, the shape of this spectral distortion and understand how it would look in one of these experiments. So this is an example showing what this looks like for a bunch of different decaying dark matter models. These have all been chosen so that they're currently um, around the limits from the CMB. And uh, this, so, this is, so these different colored lights, and you, you can see that these different models actually lead to somewhat different shapes in the spectral distortions, or they, though they do still have common features, especially around this peak. So we want to, um, so like go, going forward, we want to use this to understand a bit better, like how are these actually detectable or distinguishable in upcoming experiments? And to you know, see if we think of this as a target space, how well could we do at exploring it? I said that, you know, 21 centimeter is a really interesting experimental frontier. So again, we can use this pipeline to ask the question of if you inject, uh, if you have, um, if you inject energy into the universe, how does it show up in the 21 centimeter radiation? So the way in which we improved on previous, so we recently released this new pipeline, this new code called DM21 centimeter for doing this. The way that we improved on previous calculations is the previous calculations assumed that the dark matter energy injection was effectively homogeneous. It just homogeneously heated or ionized the universe. That's not actually a really good approximation at the end of the cosmic dark age as the galaxies are forming. We have large clumps of dark matter. Um, so neither the injection nor the deposition of energy is expected to be very homogeneous. That said, if you inject high energy enough particles, they can travel a long distance before they lose their energy. And so that smears out the effect. So we said, okay, we're just gonna go ahead and calculate it, uh, figure out what the effect is. So this is, the kind of result that this new code shows. So this is another one of those 21 centimeter brightness as a function of redshift that I showed you earlier. There's this region where there's a lot of absorption. There's this later time where there's a lot of emission. So we, these second lines are showing under the assumption where the, under the case where we do the full calculation or under the assumption where we treat the dark matter energy injection as being homogeneous, what modification to this 21 centimeter signal would you get associated with this energy injection. So you can see that in both cases, the effect is it's to heat up the universe, it's to push the 21 centimeter signal closer towards emission, uh, but the detailed structure of these modifications is quite different between the two cases. So we went ahead, um, we, we used that pipeline to see what would we expect, for example, a detection from HERA in its next phase to be able to tell us about dark matter annihilation and decay. So, some studies of 21 centimeter radiation are really just trying to look at like the average total emission or absorption as a function of redshift. We found that for that, this homogeneity approximation is actually pretty good. In the power spectrum, which measures the amount of 21 centimeter brightness radiation on different scales, uh, there's a larger effect, as you might expect. But that, the size of that difference is very dependent on what redshift you're looking at. At low redshifts, just as you're coming into ionization, so in these figures, the um, dotted line is showing what you would have with no energy injection. The solid red line is showing what you would have with our Pygusial treatment of energy injection. And the dashed line is showing what would happen if you approximated that energy injection as being homogeneous. And so you can see that in this first panel, which corresponds to a low redshift right before reionization, um, there's a big effect of energy injection, but it doesn't really matter whether you get the homogeneities right or not. At higher redshifts, around where the uh, edges experiment claimed to see its signal, uh, it's actually pretty important to get right whether, um, whether the energy injection was homogeneous or not, which in principle means you could try to distinguish them. We projected limits 
from the Hera telescope, which are mostly dominated by this uh, low redshift regime, so they don't depend very much on whether we do the inhomogeneity modeling or not. And we found that you know these constraints, so here, the solid line is our projected limit, and the gray and, uh, gray and dark gray lines represent existing constraints on dark matter decay in this parameter space. So you know this, this could you know, open up significantly improved constraints or possibly give us a signal if there is energy injection at that level. Okay, so in my last you know, five to 10 minutes, I wanna talk about one other effect, which, so, which at the moment isn't really an observable effect, but I think it's really interesting. So we've said that energy injection into the early universe from dark matter annihilation or decay or similar processes could modify the temperature of the universe, it could modify the ionization history of the universe, it could have flow on effects there on the, 20, on the um, cosmic background radiation, both in the continuum and in line features like the 21 centimeter line signal. So if something like this was happening, it means that the environment in which the first stars were forming is also pretty different than we might naively expect. Um, again, this is just, this plots on the right are just showing a couple of examples from dark history of models that, of, of how the temperature and ionization history, this ionization level and this is temperature of the universe would behave in cases that are not otherwise excluded. And the universe really could be quite a lot hotter and quite a lot more ionized than we currently think it is prior to reionization. And we wouldn't know. 21 centimeter will give us an insight on this, um, on this epoch. But at the moment, this doesn't appear to be observationally excluded. Now, if the universe is hotter, you might think, well, may maybe that's a problem. Because the way that the first stars form is that a universe is filled with gas, some of that gas is in clumps. Those clumps need to be able to cool down and lose energy in order to collapse into stars. But it's not always easy to lose energy. You need to be able to radiate somehow through some transitions. But the first stars, by default, the temperature of the universe is pretty low. They don't have enough kinetic energy to excite, for example, the atomic transitions of hydrogen. If you have heavy elements around, you have a wider range of transitions, but there aren't any heavy elements for the first stars. The universe is just hydrogen and helium to a really good approximation. So there are pretty limited ways for that low temperature gas to lose its energy. So the way that astrophysicists think the first stars form is that you have to form molecular hydrogen. And then molecular hydrogen has these vibrational modes, so it can collide with other things that can excite its vibrational levels and then it can radiate away that radiation. And so molecular hydrogen can act as a coolant in this case. But the reactions that form and destroy molecular hydrogen depend pretty sensitively on the ionization, the temperature, and how many UV photons you have around that can break up molecular hydrogen. And all of these can look pretty different in a universe that has had this energy seeping into it from the dark sector over time. So I did this study uh, led by my student, Wenzhou Chin, who, um, where we did just an analytic estimate trying to figure out roughly what would the size of these effects be, is this an interesting or important effect, or is it just negligible for models that aren't currently ruled out? Um, so yeah, this is an estimate. A more detailed study of this would need actual simulations. So we basically assumed that the halos in which these stars are forming are growing over time up until they virialize, and the density of the hydrogen gas within these dark matter halos is likewise growing over time, according to the simple prescription from the literature. And then we wrote down evolution equations for the temperature and ionization of the gas inside the halos, including for various cooling effects, including these molecular hydrogen uh, mediated cooling, Compton scattering between the uh, matter and the, radi and the radiation, uh, adiabatic heating of the gas as you compress it, it gets hotter, and the possibility of some kind of exotic energy injection. We ran this board until the halo reached its equilibrium values once their density or temperature reaches virial values. And then we held the gas density fixed and we looked at how the temperature would evolve. And we want the temperature to go down in order for the, in order for the gas in the halo to be able to collapse into stars. We used this simple criterion from the literature, which is just, is the gas cooling fast enough that we would be able to see it collapse or is it just going to sit there being pressure supported for a long time? So the effect of, and, and this is a standard calculation that has been done in the literature many years ago in the, absence of, um, in the absence of exotic energy injection. So what are the effects of energy injection? So again, 
interesting idea here is, you know, the gas clumps gets dense, eventually cools enough that it can collapse to form a star. So what are the effects of exotic energy injection on this process? Well, we've said that extra energy injection can cause more ionization of the hydrogen. So extra free electrons can catalyze the formation of molecular hydrogen. That gives you more cooling. On the other hand, if we have extra UV photons, that can break the H2 apart. That slows cooling. If we've got extra heating going on, if whenever you try, if, you know, the, this, as if this halo continually has dark matter decaying or annihilating away inside it, that will heat up the gas. That directly counteracts the cooling. That stops stars from forming. So we have these three effects, two of them going one direction, one of them going the opposite direction. So these plots on the right are showing what the impact of these effects are for a couple of different benchmark models in terms of the maximum halo mass for the gas in the halo to collapse. The usual picture is you need your halo to be big enough in order for, the, in order for stars to form. If the halo is too small, um, the gas never collapses, the stars don't form. The effect of these energy injections is to modify that critical threshold. So here, uh, the x-axis is the redshift. The lines here are showing the critical uh, minimum mass for stars to form in the halo. The black line is what you would expect in the baseline with no energy injection. And then these different colored lines show the, effect, show the impact of the various effects. The blue line here is what happens if you just turn on the extra free electrons, nothing else, and then these lines up on this other side. So that you know, reduces the critical threshold, makes formation of stars easier. And then the red and orange lines are showing the effect of um, adding in the extra UV radiation and the heating, respectively. Now, the, uh, and then the, yeah, and then the, the okay. And the overall solid orange line is showing the, the overall impact. So you see in this upper benchmark model, the impact is actually very small because these effects pretty much cancel out. In the lower example, in this lower benchmark, what actually happens is that the, is that the ionization wins. So you, we, we end up making it easier to form stars pretty much every, just everywhere, despite the fact that there are countervailing effects. One of them is more important. So what this means is this cancellation means that this effect is actually a little delicate. There are effects that go in opposite directions depending on the dark matter model, which one wins can change. However, what we found is that conveniently, given our existing constraints on dark matter decay, there is a pretty simple answer that in most of the region that's not already ruled out, the effect that wins is the ionization. You have extra free electrons, it makes molecular hydrogen form more easily, the stars form faster, the gas cools faster, the stars form faster. There is, so that's this blue region in this plot showing uh, the expected impact as a function of dark matter decay lifetime and this is a function of mass. In this red region, the effect goes in the opposite direction. You heat up the universe so much that it's really hard for the first stars to form. There's probably an actual exclusion bound down here somewhere where you heat up the universe so much that the stars never form. That would be a bad thing. Um, but as it happens, there, there are existing constraints from not messing up the cosmic microwave background and from indirect detection that carve out all this parameter space. So in pretty much all the unconstrained parameter space, this effect is to accelerate things. How would we know? if this was happening. So we refrained in this paper from trying to do a detailed forecast from how this would affect, you, this, for example, the subsequent evolution of stars and galaxies. But there is one simple thing that we did that just said, oh, so if you turn the stars on earlier, then that means you'll get more radiation uh, that factors into the 21 centimeter signal at an earlier stage. And so that will affect 21, the 21 centimeter line signal indirectly, in addition to the direct heating and ionization signals we talked about earlier. So in this case, the black line is for a benchmark 21 centimeter model, um, just what, what the 21 centimeter uh, global signal and power spectrum at a particular k at a function of redshift should look like. And then the red and blue lines are just showing how things will change as you make star formation uh, later in the red case or earlier in the blue case. So this might be observable. This is, but, you know, th this, this is a preliminary analysis need significantly more work to try to figure out exactly how we would detect it. But it does suggest that there's a non-negligible amount of parameter space where this might be an important effect. Okay, so there are various follow-ups that we could look into following up the effects on early star formation. We have that map of how energy injection would affect the background radiation spectrum. 
So we wa I want to have a look at you know, how distinguishable or detectable would these things actually be with realistic models for the instruments. We've got these nice 21 centimeter constraints on decaying dark matter, but again, these pipelines work for very arbitrary kinds of energy injection. So evaporation of primordial black holes is one example. Um, other kinds of energy injection. Some people have uh, talked to me about the possibility that maybe just the first cosmic rays accelerated by supernovae would be a standard source of exotic energy injections. You can study that with this kind of formalism as well. There's a, there's a direction that a couple of other groups have looked at, which is, you know, we talked here about accelerating star formation, but maybe, the but maybe the first black holes would also be modified by this energy injection, and I can say more about that in questions if people are interested. But yeah, so to summarize, I hope that I've persuaded you that cosmological data sets can provide powerful and interesting probes of the non-gravitational properties of dark matter or other new physics. Two cases where I, I think that you know, we definitely haven't done all we could experimentally and it will be interesting to see what happens in the next few years are the primordial 21 centimeter line and perhaps further in the future a CMB energy spectrum spectroscopy. We already have from the CMB anisotropies and, also, and to a lesser degree from the Lyman alpha forest some pretty broadly applicable and stringent limits on annihilating and decaying dark matter. And what we've done has we've built up a toolbox of public numerical tools that let you figure out if you throw high energy particles, non-thermal particles into the early universe, what do they do in each of these observables? Uh, so in the, in the cosmic photon background generally, both in the continuum and in the redshift to 21 centimeter line. And this last analysis I told you about suggests that there might also be impacts on the first stars. That's uh, something to follow up on, but tentatively it looks like this kind of energy injection would generally make the first stars form earlier. All right. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. I mean, I, if, you, if you send me a reference, I'm happy to look at it. I mean, we've measured the, CM, so we've measured the CMB from space. Like Planck is a space-based experiment. WMAP was a space-based experiment. So it would be, um, yeah, I guess surprising to me if there was a significant confounding factor from the oceans. So, another question? I was going to ask you about the elite, uh, elite coupling of the dark matter with yeah. the cell. Yeah. What do we know about Yeah, um, so there are some, good, right. So people talk about the possibility of self-interacting dark matter, which typically means a cross-section large enough that the typical dark matter particle will interact with another dark matter particle on the dynamical time scale of the system. If you have a self-interaction that is that strong, then it, um, th then it does significantly affect how the dark matter is distributed. If you say the self-interaction is much weaker than that, then at some point it just becomes indistinguishable from zero, modulo that of course we know that we believe that dark matter particles will interact with each other through gravity. In terms of just getting the observed structure of dark matter in the universe, just gravity seems to work pretty well. There are, um, there are some observations which suggest that maybe, especially towards the center of halos, dark matter might have a distribution that is not exactly what you would expect just from gravity. It is pretty hotly disputed, like it's an ongoing research question as to whether that's true or whether the issue is just that in the centers of these areas, there's a lot of other matter that is not dark matter, right? Like in the centers of galaxies, there's a lot of baryonic matter. It definitely has non-gravitational interactions. As the baryonic matter gets transported around and moves around, it will pull the dark matter with it. So it's an open question as to whether you can explain all the variation in the dark matter distribution within galaxies just by, um, 
yeah, like ju just, just through gravity plus baryonic effects. It, I, I guess what I would say is the kind of cross sections that you need to meaningfully affect this are pretty large by particle physics standards. Like when I say uh, every, a dot, the average dark matter particle would interact once per dynamical time with the system, that corresponds for like GeV scale dark matter, that would correspond to cross sections similar to the strong interactions in the standard model. So, you know, not impossible at all, but there's also a large swath of dark matter candidates where the interactions are just so weak you would never see a signal. Question on the back there? Yes. Oh, that's a, that's an yeah okay that's that's a really interesting question, um, yeah because in some sense this is kind of an th this is kind of an orthogonal effect. Well, so in the case that we're looking at here, the energy injection is coming from the dark matter mass. So the so the energy injection is so so in that case it is kind of orthogonal in that the energy injection probably doesn't care about how fast the dark matter is going relative to the baryons. Although I guess if yeah, I mean, like, to the degree that they ended up being meaningfully offset, maybe that could have some impact. I, I think it would be a detailed question. If your energy injection was coming, like, just from scattering, like dark matter baryon scattering, then the energy that you're transferring is kinetic energy, and you would care, I think, quite a lot about how fast they were going relative to each other. So there, there, there might be an interesting perturbation. So, sorry, I, I'm, not, I'm not good at identifying. Okay, I, I was going around, on, I was on the left hand side, hand raised there, yep. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so I guess what I will say here is um, at a very hand wavy level, yeah, that seems like a natural connection, but if I wanted to make it quantitative or to understand you know, what I would actually expect this to look like in JWST, I think I would want to do a simulation rather than our sort of simple analytic, oh, it probably lowers the star formation threshold a bit, estimate that we did here. Just, I'll just say this because it's cool. Another thing that JWST claims to have seen is a pretty large black hole candidate at a pretty high redshift, like a redshift 10.1. That's been proposed as, a, as um, an example of a direct collapse black hole, where the idea there is kind of the opposite of this star formation picture. So in our star formation picture, what you need to form stars is the gas needs to cool rapidly and fragment. So you make a lot of stars. Uh, the direct collapse black hole picture says if instead the cooling is inhibited, so the whole gas cloud just sort of sl cools very slowly and adiabatically, then maybe rather having it fragment into many stars, you can have the whole thing collapse into a big black hole. And this is a proposed mechanism to get big black holes in the early universe. Not confirmed, but a number of the people who've worked on that topic, which does not include me, um, were pretty excited about JWST finding this apparent like, large black hole at redshift 10.1 as a possible candidate of this kind of direct collapse scenario. And, and so again, this is an area that I'm interested in, but it's primarily other people's work so far. Um, there have been some studies saying, okay, well, one way to get that kind of direct, that kind of slow adiabatic contraction would be exactly the latter two effects that I talked about here, the heating of the gas or the um, production of UV photons to dissociate the molecular hydrogen, both go in the di that direction of slowing the cooling. Now, for the class of models that we looked at here, it turns out that uh, you know, the net effect goes in the opposite direction. It accelerates the cooling. So, I mean, maybe these models will be ruled out based on it would destroy all the direct collapse black holes and stop them from forming. But this is another place where there could be potential observational consequences of early heating or UV radiation or, or ionization.
so sorry, I mean, I guess like it is true that like just from just from gravitational effects, there is certainly energy and momentum transfer between the dark and visible matter, right? I mean, like just, um, yeah. So I guess the so I mean, like it's it's certainly true that that there is just a gravitational coupling between the two sectors, and that affects the distribution of the baryons throughout the universe. That's in fact, like we, we think the main way the baryons are distributed through the universe is determined by falling into the gravity wells associated with the dark matter distribution. The effect from just gravitational energy transfer in this kind of observable would be extremely tiny. Uh, again, there we don't get to access the mass energy of the dark matter, we just get to access the kinetic energy, and gravity is a pretty weak force. And, and of course, there's also the that is also incorporated in the standard cosmological simulation. Is there time for one more question? Uh, you talked a lot about like energy injection from dark yeah. matter to the standard matter. Is there any possibility of like the reverse? Yeah, absolutely. So this was a really hot question a couple of years ago because I showed you this little data point on this 21 centimeter plot where the edges experiment claimed to have seen a signal over here which would imply, so you see, so this is a gas temperature measurement on the y-axis. This black line is what you would expect. This green line was a kind of model that could fit this edges observation. So it suggested that the gas was actually a lot cooler than you would have naively expected. Uh, so, and one of the hypotheses that people came up for that is maybe the dark matter is acting as a refrigerant. Maybe we're transferring energy out of the baryons and, and into the dark matter. It turns out to be pretty hard to get an effect this big in a way that is consistent with all other constraints, but it's not totally impossible. Uh, there's an, an example of a model that kind of works as if you have a small fraction of the dark matter, like a you know, 10 to the minus three fraction of the dark matter that, is, um, that carries some tiny electric charge, like a milli charge, then not even milli charge, smaller than milli, like you know, mini charge, micro charge then uh, that component could, would scatter with the ordinary matter, and it scatters through Rutherford scattering, which means that it's very enhanced at low velocities, and the universe is, the dark matter is pretty slow moving at this time, so that's good for you. And uh, then if you have that component of the dark matter also be able to interact with the rest of the dark matter, so the rest of the dark matter can act as like a heat sink, then you can, um, then there is a narrow parameter space where you can transfer enough energy out of the standard model into the dark matter to make that work, but it's pretty hard. I will also say that if something like that was going on, then um, when Hera and other experiments measured the 21 centimeter power spectrum, there were some papers written that suggested there should be like a big clear honking signal in the 21 centimeter power spectrum associated with that. So, so it's very checkable. I mean, that said, again, there is already an existing up limit from the Saris experiment, which is blue, here, which looked at exactly the same redshift and exactly the same kind of signal and didn't see the same absorption feature. So, I mean, it's not like super inconsistent if you look at the error bars in the upper limits, but it, it sort of, I mean, it, it doesn't, it certainly wasn't a confirmation. So, but, but yes, but in principle, yes, the energy flow could go both ways. I talked about one way here because that's kind of the, the natural direction if you're taking the mass energy out of the dark matter and putting it into the visible matter, but you absolutely can go in the opposite direction.